great to be here, kick this phenomenal day off. Nice, brisk day in Boston. I am Mirza Sifrik. I am co-founder and CEO of Veritas Genetics, uh, another Boston-based company that you might know or not know. I'm here to uh, let you know a little bit about what we're up to, uh, but also to talk a little bit about why. And this is going to help a lot. OK. So uh, Boston is a phenomenal place. There is a tremendous amount of biotechnology technology and other companies, a lot of innovation, phenomenal universities. And the confluence of all of those things bring us here today to talk about how all those things come together to create a better, brighter future. I was uh, in the speaker room just earlier today, and there were, you know, three of us there. With each, uh, each has four kids, which is statistically very unique. And uh, every time I think about what we're doing and why we're doing it, I think about the kids and the grandkids and the legacy we're going to leave behind. So, in many ways, uh, Boston is the right place for this uh, to be started. And I could appreciate if we can start the clock so I don't talk for the next two hours because there's plenty that we can talk about. <laughs> so later on, you'll be hearing from another uh, co-founder of Veritas, Dr. Church, Dr. George Church from Harvard Medical School. I recently read uh, one of the books about George and his lab uh, working on the re resurrection of the uh, woolly mammoth, and in it, George is quoted to say that sometimes he feels like he is from the future. And he's certainly living here in the present among us, and that's, a, that's both an honor and a privilege. And it brings us to my own story of having, um, of being here in Boston and uh, living in this phenomenal uh, environment that we are in. Uh, one of the thoughts is that um, the, in this genetics world, we talk about the, the DNA and the environment conferring traits. So in many ways, it's not just about the DNA, it's about the environment that we find ourselves in. And the environment in Boston is one of respect, of inclusiveness, and about caring. It's the kind of environment that allowed a 18-year-old kid from Bosnia, uh, after living through four years of uh, war in the middle of Europe, in one of the worst and unnecessary conflicts there, uh, to arrive in Logan at age of 18 without knowing anyone here in Boston or in the United States for that matter, to arrive there without a penny to his name, and study hard, work hard, be um, included in the community, in a very caring community, and then one day to start a company with someone like George and to be here at the stage talking to you about it. Um, lots of great examples of the environment in Boston that matters. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit about what we do, but more importantly, why, and why Boston. And um, I'm also here to hopefully engage and send a message to the community in Boston that you know, the folks that are working on these high-tech uh, innovations and, and, and high-tech companies really want your thoughts and opinions, want to engage the public, want to engage the environment in Boston so that we can both understand and foster and improve it for the future generations. So that's why it's important we have these types of conversations. But back to why Boston and um, why so many phenomenal, you know, game-changing things uh, come out of Boston in this environment, and um, I mentioned George Church, let it be heard maybe here for the first time, but I truly really believe that George is a Leonardo da Vinci of our times. He is a futurist, a genius, and perhaps one of the most important, if not the most important scientists in the world today. So pick your favorite scientist in the world and in the history, if they were going to be inventing and creating today, I guarantee you they would be in Boston. This is the right place, this is the right environment, this is the right apex of technology and biology. 
because we're entering a complete new era where the te technology and the biology are opening unprecedented opportunities. So with, with, with George and people like that in Boston, uh, a lot of why centers around, well, obviously it must be in our DNA, right? But, so let's unpack this idea behind DNA and tell you a little bit about what we do at Veritas and, and, and hopefully get a message across as to why, why it matters to you, why it would matter to your kids, why it matters far beyond uh, Boston and the United States, why it matters globally. So DNA, uh, interestingly enough, in every single one of the cells of your body, you have the entire blueprint for life. So just think about that for a second. Every single cell has your whole genome. And if you could find the start and the end and unravel it, it would be almost as tall as I am. In every single cell of your body, your whole genome, about almost six feet tall. The, the entire genome is uh, three billion base pairs, three billion times two. And the reason we know that is that in the 90s, a phenomenal effort by many scientists, including many in Boston, in US and internationally, um, took on a pretty audacious project to sequence, meaning to read, one entire human genome, hopefully as complete as we could possibly get it. That's why we know it's three billion base pairs. And that's why we know it's, it's uh, north of 20,000 genes. We actually believed that it was gonna be a lot more genes than it turned out to be. And that effort um, was spread out across many different places and in many, many rooms and laboratories where people are working on pieces of the genome in different places and then assembling it together to create the map for one human being. It took less than we thought, about 10 years or so, and it cost $3 billion for one person. Maybe the best taxpayer money ever spent. Today at Veritas, we sequence an entire human genome and interpret it more importantly and report it out for $1,000. I'm not aware of, and if you are, let me know, of anything in history that's come down in a price by a factor of a million just over a decade or so. This is now presenting unprecedented opportunities for us to go after, to understand it, to report it on an individual level and learn from it, give you that information, but also learn in aggregate about it. So one way to think about this genome, imagine playing Scrabble with just four letters. You know, my English is good, but uh, it took me a while to get it, and my kids are far better Scrabble players than I am. Uh, I, I find it hard enough with all the letters. But if you could think about just using four letters to represent life, it's a tremendous amount of information. It is subtle, though. A small change in one letter can be the difference between health and sickness, between longevity and quality of life. I wanna go back to what I said, genes plus environment equals traits. It's not only genetics. How we use and interact with the environment is just as important. But you have to understand your baseline, you have to understand the code, you have to understand where you personally sit, you know, in order to optimize the environment. So we all exercise, we all try to eat as good as we possibly can, but we don't really know if we are influencing our health in a positive or a negative way over the long run. You know, at the turn of the centuries, we had infectious diseases, we had, um, uh, you know, a very large per percentage of kids, you know, dying in the first five years of life from, uh, infectious diseases we can't even pronounce today or, 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 or don't talk about anymore. We've attacked a lot of these chronic conditions and we're now tr transitioning into, we've attacked a lot of these acute conditions, things that happen um, acutely, but now we're attacking these chronic conditions, the types of diseases that take a long time to develop 
long time to treat. And we all need to participate in that. We need to understand our genetic baseline and how to optimize the environment so that we can have the best possible outcome on things that slowly accumulate and affect our health. And I'm not just talking about the health of our body, I'm also talking about the health of our mind. Just as important to be a healthy 85-year-old or a 90-year-old, 90, 90 um, you know, in body and in mind. So a little bit more about the DNA. So if you, I want to get the message across that, you know, we wrestled this thing down, not me personally, people like George and the scientists who went and mapped the first human genome, and a tremendous amount of data was generated. And it was rooms and rooms of machines sequencing bits and pieces. And the best analogy is what's happened in the computer industry. And if we go back in time in Boston, in the last big disruption you know, period when digital equipment corporations and people like that you know, ushered a whole new era of mainframe computers and changes, you know, and then went from rooms and rooms of computers to a desktop, that's where we are in time today. That is the best analogy, that in the last few years, we now have a desktop machine, a computer that fits on top of a pretty sturdy steel desk, nonetheless, but it does 48 genomes in three days. 48 human genomes in three days, and generates a tremendous amount of data. So that's where the new problem has emerged in interpreting this data. Now that we can get at it, what do we do with it? How do we interpret it? How do we deliver it to you, to your physician? How do we get you to use it to have a better outcome? The amount of data is astonishing. If you took those um, Scrabble letters and you spread them across, it, it would go from here to Sydney, Australia. I guess we just picked the furthest spot you can possibly go eight times there and back. Uh, to make a better analogy, for one person, it's about 75 gigabytes of, uh, of, of data. It's actually, when it's all said and done, twice as much. And that's about eight high-def movies. That's a tremendous amount of data for one person that's being generated. What about two? What about however many there are on the, <laughs> on the slide behind me? How are we going to wrestle that down? How are we going to use this information? How are we going to interpret it and make it? And more importantly, not just how, but why. And we take a little pause here and then talk about the effect that Boston as a community has and the environment that we foster, the environment of caring. You know, we founded Veritas very much in the mirror image and the culture that is one of the, the lab of Dr. Church at Harvard Medical of enabling, of sharing, of caring. You know, we want people to participate in understanding their genomes and sequence their genomes because we want them to contribute that data and knowledge so that we can learn more in aggregate together about ourselves. In turn, that will give us the information that we will give maybe to ourselves, maybe to our children, maybe to their own children. We have an opportunity to create this tremendous legacy of information and uh, make it available. So as we start to expand this, as you can see, the problem compounds. We're generating huge amounts of data, and, uh, and the scale becomes enormous. As a matter of fact, if we did several million genomes, we would generate enough data um, that would, be, that would surpass everything that's currently available on the internet, including all the kitten videos and YouTube and such, all the other important stuff. So there are emerging problems that are, we're going to be wrestling with going forward as we start to do millions, millions of genomes. And so we're already reaching a point at which human beings are not going to be able to interpret millions of genomes like we do today our understanding and the ability to query across millions of genomes and, and, and make health conclusions is going to be best suited if we employ machines to do our work. So machine learning and artificial intelligence is something that we are very actively incorporating in how we interpret and analyze the genomes today. But as we get out to big numbers, this is the only way to do it.
you think about it, this understanding of technology and biology, it's, it's very unique to Boston and for Boston. We have both sides of it, and this is why this is the environment in which both the technologists and biology folks do so well and work so well. It's both incredibly powerful but also necessary, this being a perfect example. We won't do millions of genomes without AI and machine learning. So the other thing we can do is store and make all this data available. And frankly, being here in Boston at the right time is just as important. We now have the entire infrastructure of data and computing on the cloud where we can store, manipulate, use that data, query that data. It wouldn't be possible. There'd be, there wouldn't be enough space in this room to fill it with computers to store and analyze millions of genomes. But there is an aggregate when you get out to the cloud computing infrastructure. And that, of course, is something that grows with our consumer use of cloud infrastructure to store the pictures, videos, and other things. This enables us to now use that same infrastructure to store the genomes. So thank you for taking all those selfies, keep doing it. Drive the cost down, it will help the humanity in, in ways you probably didn't predict. So the other thing, it's probably going through the back of your mind, okay, genetics, genome, interesting, cool, exciting, Boston, makes sense, check, 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 check. How do I do this? Why do I do this? Why does it matter to me personally? I, I get helping the, helping the world and contributing data to research, but what's in it for me? How am I going to get this information? How am I going to interact with this information? Here's another place where we're already deploying artificial intelligence in solving the way you interact with the genomes. So giving you a report on a bunch of pages, or even a fancy website where you can go and click around. Everybody's got busy lives, everybody's traveling, and um, lots of competing interests for your time. We need to incorporate this information in a way that is just seamless, that you can use it every day. And for that, we're thankful that there are now entire platforms in the environments to do that, such as Siri and Google Home and Alexa. So we recently uh, hooked up Alexa to the back of our whole genome report to actually interact with it. I'll show you a quick video. Alexa, Ask Veritas, is my report ready? Yes, it is. Would you like me to give you the highlights? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, I have sent you an email with the highlights so you can look at it later. Alexa, Ask Veritas, how is my cholesterol? In your last blood work, your cholesterol levels were slightly elevated. You should also know you have a genetic variant that predisposes you to having high cholesterol. Would you like me to recommend a restaurant for lunch of healthy food options? <laughs> no, thank you. Not right now. Would you like me to schedule you a test to check your levels? Yes, please. I am on it. Alexa, ask Veritas, am I allergic to Tylenol? You are a fast metabolizer of Tylenol, so you should talk to your doctor about adjusting your dosage. So we basically envision uh, many different ways in which people are going to get access to their genetic information. Right. And it should be device agnostic, user interface agnostic. We should provide it when it's useful and functional. Right. Uh, so this is one of the things we're working on. All right. So there was a... To our knowledge, the first demo of using artificial intelligent assistant to interact with your genome, this is the kind of stuff we're working on. You know, despite the complicated science and, 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 and technology behind it, we need to make this easy, accessible to, to all of you and incorporate it into your daily lives. And, and what better place to do that than Boston? Um, and of course, um, not to be forgotten, the entrepreneurial environment that exists in Boston that mentors and teaches young and aspiring entrepreneurs, helps them build companies, teaches them to the progression of the business, 
uh, as it grows is unprecedented. Uh, and of course, um, when it comes to the intersection of technology and biology, only possible in Boston. So uh, I, somewhat in a conclusion, you know, there's a quote here from, from Steve Jobs that basically says that um, the biggest innovation of the 21st century will be at the intersection of biology and technology. A new era is beginning. He said this in 2011. And um, the message really is that if Steve Jobs was starting a new company, this is most likely what he would be doing. And he would have to be in Boston, right? I mean, no better place to do that. Another milestone that Apple, that we all aspire to as a, as a company that's touched millions of lives, um, another milestone they accomplished recently was that they shipped uh, 41 million iPhones in a quarter. It was a significant milestone for the company. And I made a prediction that in the near future, not like tomorrow, but probably within the decade, we will be doing 41 million genomes a quarter. And frankly, that can't come soon enough because even at 41 million genomes a quarter, it would, it would take 45 years to sequence the entire population that we have today without growth. This information will generate very unique insights into our individual biology. It will also, in aggregate, allow us to unlock the secrets to health and longevity. It's an example of what um, information and value is in DNA. You're going to hear lots of phenomenal talks today from lots of phenomenal folks in Boston. You'll find, I think, a very common thread in reading and writing of DNA, as you hear later about gene editing and topics of that sort. So thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoy and have a wonderful day listening to our future speakers. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you again this morning. Mirza, thank you so much. So I have one question for you before you leave. This is the future form. So I want to know, is the future here? Can, when can I do that on my Alexa at home? And everyone here, you're probably questioning, when can you do that? That's not the question we agree upon. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tough. I like it. Um, soon. Uh, soon? Very soon. You can today go and have your genome sequenced and interpreted for $1,000. That's what Veritas does today for thousands of clients in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and elsewhere. Uh, you can do that with the assistance of your uh, physician because there will be information there that will benefit your doctor, such as over 220 drugs that we test for, for which people may have a bad reaction or need to change a dose. Those are the kinds of information that your physician will, will, will want to uh, know. Okay. And we'll, we'll make sure that they get that information. But for everything else, the traits and risks and other things that you should involve in everyday life, like when you walk into Whole Foods, you should you ask yourself, okay, kale, is kale the right answer, is that really right for me versus my brother or sister or my parents, that level of personalization is imminent, it's coming, and it will be not just on Alexa, it will be on Siri, and it will be incorporated in your phone in many ways, and that's imminent. Great. Thanks a million. Thank you.